Hey folks, welcome this Thursday afternoon with lots of background noise going on. So my name is Lisa Mason Ziegler and I welcome you to this Lisa Live broadcast on Facebook Live. And um, today we're gonna be talking about container. Hey Tyler, um, container gardening, which is kind of a little different, isn't it, for, um, for a flower farmer. But I have to tell you that I got more enjoyment last year out of my containers because that's like, I think most of us that are farmers especially kind of get into this whole farming thing because we love plants and the whole thing about plants. And I was always a struggling, hey Colleen, I was a struggling container garden person because I have no time. I think that's true with most people. And so I thought after the great success that I had last year, after reading a friend's book, and she just had some of the greatest tips that changed my life in container garden, and I thought I would share those with you guys. So, yep, we're loading up here. So I'm glad to see people joining us. And um, as always, I encourage you to please um, like and share this broadcast with your friends, especially this one's really, um, hey, Lisa from Georgia. Um, oh, thanks, Jennifer. And so if you like this broadcast and then share it, that'll not only save it on your Facebook feed, it really helps me. That's what helps me to, to keep doing these. And so I appreciate it. And I think this one's got a really far reach. Lots of home gardeners, not just farmers. So you can um, learn about stuff like this and more things that I have going on. Hey, Beth and Shelly. Um, lots of things going on by signing up for my farm news. And it's really easy to sign up for, hey, Tabitha. Um, it's really easy to sign up for my farm news now. I just got this information. Wait a minute, let me look it up. I didn't write it down. Um, because we literally just subscribed to this. So if you want to sign up for my farm newsletter and you haven't, all you have to do is text to the number 66866. Again, the number is 66866. And just text to me, flower. You will get an automatic reply. On that automatic reply, you put in your email address. You don't even put, need to put your name, and that will get you signed up to get my farm news. Um, and we send out a lot more educational stuff than we do salesy things. So hopefully you're, um, you'll be in the loop and you won't miss anything. Let me get back to my notes here. Um, so, hey, that's something brand new that we're just trying out for a couple of weeks, and we want to see if it really works. I'm heading out tomorrow to Asheville to the Mother Earth News Fair, and it's a great way with big crowds for me to be able to get people. Hey, Carolyn from Standardsville. So, I want to jump right into our subject, and then the sun's kind of bright this time of day, but I'm going to show you around some of the containers. Um, that I have that really aren't even planted yet, but we're gonna look at the bones of containers, and then we'll look at my hay racks that have been planted that are so beautiful. So I'm just gonna start right off with talking about containers, and you know, this seems obvious, but not everybody understands this. Hey, Mimi Spears, guess what, Mimi? I am harvesting peonies from the peony you gave me like 25 years ago. It's the early single, so I think of you every time I um, harvest those hot pink peonies. So the first thing I want to talk about is the easiest step, y'all, is to plant shade plants in the shade and sun plants in the sun. I know that seems pretty elementary, but I cannot tell you how many containers I see or people ask me questions about containers, and they've got sun stuff in the shade or worse yet, shade stuff cooking alive out in the sun. So you need to figure out what you have and then purchase accordingly. And so I already knew this tip, so I'm not going to um, attribute everything that I've learned to my friend Jessica Walliser, who wrote the book that I read. I already figured out this first tip because it seemed to me that I kind of fell into this. Larger containers make care of the containers so much easier. So I wrote down in my experience, the very smallest container that you will find me to have is a two um, 
hey, Jana from Georgia, and Lisa is in Georgia too, so we have conversations going on. Um, for those of you that aren't watching this live on Facebook, you're watching it later on my blog, people are commenting and um, checking out each other. So the smallest container that I think is usable is two gallons. And so what is that? So think about two milk jugs, but I really don't even go that small. I think that the smallest container that I like to use is at least 18 inches um, in diameter and at least nine to 10 inches deep. And that is like the smallest because here's the science y'all. The larger the mass of soil, the less often you have to water it. And that's what we're all looking for, right? Less water and chores. So the size, I mean, I know how cute it is to have all these different little cutesy containers grouped together. I mean, you could maybe do that in an area that is shaded first off, and that's a very convenient, you're gonna walk out your front door and water them right on your front porch that you see it every day so you remember to do it. But large containers are the really big rub on this. So, um, the other thing about large containers is plants thrive. Think about plants having more room to grow their roots, right? So the larger container is really, really um, a key. And the other thing is to also, and I'm gonna show you my hay racks, and this is hard because I know plants are expensive. I mean, I understand why they're expensive and I also hurt because they're expensive because I also um, purchase plants. Because when I'm doing containers, y'all, a container, like, you know, as soon as it's warm enough, you want your containers done because you're starting to entertain, do things outdoors, um, and you want your containers to be gorgeous. Well, if you want your containers to be gorgeous, in my experience, is you have to buy big plants. And so my number one tip right behind large containers is to buy six inch pots of plants to plant into your container. Cause you're gonna look at my hay racks that were only planted. I had a bridal shower here a week ago with no power, by the way, we had no electricity um, because of a storm and it all ended up, we had, we had a great time. Anyway, I planted this container like three days before the party and it was gorgeous. People just died over it. If I had bought little teeny cell packs trying to save a buck, I think you're better off to do fewer containers, do one or two big ones, buy bigger plants and have instant beautification it makes you take better care of them. You water them more often. It's just all around a better um, deal. So I'm gonna, when I show you the hay racks, I'm gonna say this now in case I don't say it then. Each, I have two hay racks and they're big. They're, oh my goodness, when I see the window boxes that places sell, I think, oh my gosh, no wonder people hate met window boxes. They are so small, there's no way that plants can really survive and thrive in them. My hay racks, I think, are probably 12 inches from front to back, and I'm looking at them from the side, and they are over 12, maybe 14 or 15 inches in the back. They're huge, and they were expensive to purchase, but they work beautifully because there's a large mass of soil. It took 11 six-inch pots to fill each one and it'll be beautiful all summer long. Um, so large containers, large plants that you're planting into that. And the other thing I wrote in a little side note to myself, it's really hard to start our own seeds for this purpose because you will have had to have really started them a long time, unless you have a greenhouse, which I don't. So, and it takes a lot of heat to heat a greenhouse to start a plant early enough to get it big enough. That's why plants are expensive, y'all. They've been in a warm environment, sucking the propane um, to get them to where they are when we come and pick them out. So that's why I do not start my own plants for most of my containers. We do have one thing started for my shade garden, but they're so tiny, I don't even know that. I, I'm, I'm gonna have to buy some now <laughs> because I don't wanna wait five more weeks, right? I mean. 
the early spring, early summer is the best entertaining time. It's when it's not so hot. So I figure all of these things are for the betterment of my containers. So what do I use for a container mix? Well, Jessica's book has a couple of different recipes in it, but what my go-to has been for years, because I'm a big recycler, right? I think everybody is. If your containers from last year did not have any pest problems or disease problems, what I tend to do is gather my containers, or actually my containers are so big now you're gonna see them, that I take my wheelbarrow to where the containers are. And I pull out last year's plant debris, you don't want that, and put that in my compost heap. Then I rough up and break up the mix that's in there. And then I take out about the top I'd say the top good one third of soil at least and put it into my wheelbarrow. And I do that to several of my big containers. Then I look at how much soil I have in my wheelbarrow and I add a third of compost to that mass, right? And then I add organic dry fertilizer to that mix and I mix that all up and then I have more than enough fertilizer to go back in my containers. You will never buy potting mix again. You can make such superior seed starting, I'm not seed starting, I'm sorry, container mix on your own. Um, and for compost, anything that's a finished product, you can buy it in a bag, you can buy it at your local buy the dump truck load, um, aged manure, any of those finished products add moisture holding as well as nutrients to your plants. So they all really work well. So as a general rule, and this is hard to remember, how many times did I not follow this rule and then in the coming years, not focusing on what I was doing, I didn't follow this rule and I have unplanted and replanted my containers. I like to have my soil level at least two inches below the rim of the pot. That makes a well for you to pour water or water into, and it holds water until it drains down. Oh my gosh, to have the soil level with the rim is the kiss of death because you'll have to stand there, which we won't do. That's the reality, right? You won't do. Um, you water, the water runs off, and your plants just never get a deep watering. I also do what's called the double dip. I saw this back in the day when we had these great gardening shows on Home Garden TV. Um, the Gardener's Diary um, visited this amazing container garden lady, and that's one of the things that she said. She waters all of her containers, and, and she filled up that well, and then she went back and did it all over again. And so I call that the double dip, and that really, really works well. And here's the other thing, y'all. Do not depend on rain. Rain, unless you have an all day steady rain, literally all day, and your containers are open and not under trees, that might water your pot that day. But I water, I mean, how many times have my neighbors said, look at that crazy woman, she's watering it, rained yesterday. Well. Rain does not cut it, you know? Um, so I water every, well, I'm gonna share that secret, what I learned from Jessica. I used to water every day, but now that I have large containers with great soil, and I have found a way to keep them moist longer, um, I really only water every other, or sometimes even every third day. So I'll, that'll bring me to Jessica's book. Um, Jessica's book is called Container Gardening Complete, and I uh, do not, this is not an affiliated link. You can get it from wherever you want to. Um, she wrote the book that I also recommend, Good Bug, Bad Bug, and this, I believe, is the most comprehensive container book on the market. It tells you how to make some containers, how to plant them, maintain them, and the tip that I learned, oh my goodness, that changed me forever. Um, and I'm gonna pick this up and we're gonna walk around a little bit. And then I do have a couple of questions. Excuse me while I lift this up. I uh, do have a couple of questions that people have submitted. But before we do that, I wanna look at some of these containers. Um, I have major construction going on 
around me today as well as I have neighbors weed eating. So sorry for all the noise. So I am going to turn this around and I'm gonna start out, you know, we're here in my shade garden and I'm just gonna look at a couple of the containers that are back here and just kind of tell you the tips that I have learned. So you can see this big container right here. Um, so this is under that tulip magnolia tree. First off, I have learned that the only way to really have great annuals under a big tree is to put them in a container. And then those containers um, are lifted off of the soil so that the tree roots can't grow up in it. I mean, just set them on a bricks or something. Um, and although this particular container is actually buried partially in the ground, to make it not so tall, it is on bricks down there. So this has been here all winter. The fern just came up, um, but I had pansies in here all winter. And I like one of the tips for shade gardening. One of the tips that I really enjoy um, is I love ferns. Ferns do really well in containers. And I'll tell you what my favorite mix is here in a minute. But I've learned to choose when I'm selecting ferns perennial ferns so that fern wintered over in that pot and now is just coming up that's one less plant that i have to purchase i have three containers or actually four containers that have ferns underneath this tree because i put a mix my favorite go-to shade mix is ferns of any kind i mean i love to use asparagus fern which is a house plant but they don't come back I love using ferns um, as kind of the pointy part of the container. And then I love to use white caladiums and in combination with either white impatience or white begonias. Y'all, you just do not know how cool and refreshing and beautiful that is. And this summer on one of the Facebook Lives, um, this container and these two others we're about to look at should have those in there and they thrive in this shade environment now back here is another pot like you saw up there um, and those are angel leaf begonias which i have come to love these are not the biggest um, we bought these early in the season so they aren't quite so big but you can see the fern is coming up um, it was a really a little too early for us to go shopping, but I had to buy plants for that party I was speaking of. So Suzanne and I are making another trip back to the plant depart store um, to finish off this pot. And look at this sweet little pot. This is a wire basket that was actually a harvest basket. And this has one of those ferns. This will get caladiums and either white begonias or white um, impatience, whether it's New Guinea or the regular. And let me tell you, so caladiums, if you're not familiar with those, you know, I was never a caladium fan until I matched them up with green foliage of the fern and a flowering plant the same color. Caladiums come in white and green or pink and green, and there's probably other colors. When you coordinate the flowers with the color in that caladium, this little basket is so beautiful. Hey, Mary. So this will get caladiums and whatever flowering shade flower I find at the plant store um, that comes in white. And look at, this is a different fern. And these just sit, as you can see, in my hellebore garden. Um, so this one is really beautiful. Look how green that is. So this had huge caladiums last year um, with, I think I put actually pink caladiums here and pink flowers, which it may very well be what I do this year. And notice that special looking container there, y'all. That is just an old tree. I love to plant trees and those big containers they come in. Um, actually, we're planting some hellebores around the front of this so it'll be skirted. And that would be a, just a perfect um, situation. Now, I wanna show you my one of the tips I learned from Jessica's book. So, if you can see, this is, um, this this is a huge container. Um, I can't, it is so heavy that I can't even lift it. Um, and the problem that I have with these pots that are lined um, with this fiber stuff is they always dried out so quickly, right? I mean, they look beautiful, but maintaining them is like lose your mind. 
And then, and I can't believe I did not think of this, y'all. Then I read in Jessica's book to line the inside of this with a trash bag. So all of my racks, you'll see it on my hay racks too, have this plastic that's just inside of this liner and they have holes punched in the bottom so that water can get out, but moisture does not escape um, through the sides. This, oh my goodness, last year, if you go to my Instagram page and scroll back, this, and it, see how it's kind of turning right now? When it's planted with plants, this had coleuses. The photo that I showed for this Facebook Live was this container. This thing would rock like this last year. I posted a video, it was the most relaxing thing ever. But I could never keep this pot hydrated until I lined it with plastic. Um, and I will tell you that these, all these containers we've just looked at, I water every three days. Um, and they do beautifully. And it's because of great potting mix that I make. Um, and they have food and as well as um, large containers, right? So look at this little container. I put this up here because this looks like a big container to some people, but it's not really. Look how narrow it gets down at the bottom. I cannot, and it, look, it's got clover growing in it. I cannot, and it's terracotta. I could not keep this container watered. I mean, whatever goes in it just is not very happy. Um, so, large containers planting large plants, and with me saying that, I'm gonna walk over here to where the hay racks are. The sun is kinda overcast right now. I have figured out that this isn't the greatest time of day to do Facebook Lives. Not only was my weed eater man here earlier, but Suzanne and Kelly are still here, so they're liable to come out that door any minute they're upstairs working so look at my hay racks y'all these things they're 44 inches long and there's the wind until I lined these um, liners with trash bags I could not keep them moist and you can see the trash bag right now but within a week all of this stuff will be spilling over I realized that we just lost connection because, sorry about that, y'all. Um, shoot, I'm gonna walk over there again. I think it let me, you know, the Wi-Fi is on this end of the building and on the other end of the building, and it does not always hold. Um, so I'm just trying to give you guys a big look. So that's 44 inches long, and it took 11 six-inch plants to fill that container up. And they're just beautiful. I mean, it's Dusty Miller and Marigolds. We have found that this is in full blast and sun. And interesting enough, see how that overhang? Those hay racks get zero water when it rains. So it's totally dependent on us. And they basically get watered three times a week. Um, and those, the plants that just really survive out here for us in this wind and heat is um, verbena and lantana, which are of course all pollinator favorites. Um, and Dusty Miller and Marigolds, and there's a couple other, I mean, you, I'm like everybody else. You go over to the plant store and they have all these amazing things that you've never planted before. <laughs> and you don't know about it and you think, oh, it's so beautiful, I have to try that. So there's a couple of things in there that I'm not real familiar with. So I'm gonna walk back over here. Here's our sunflower, corn, that's a lot of that's being planted this evening. We planted our, I'm walking back over to our little spot over here. Um, you know, the weather is starting to warm up and my best advice to you if you wanna have low maintenance, great containers, have fewer containers, make them larger, buy larger plants, give them, make great soil at home by reusing. So I'm gonna turn this back around. To um, so let me just set this up so I can answer some of y'all's questions here. Um, I mean, it's really that simple, and I brought this as an example. My family is famous for, um, on Steve's side, every Easter, 
all the, the sisters and sister-in-laws and nieces now that they're adults, um, we bring, we give plants to each other at Easter dinner. You know, I mean, we'll bring some little sprig of something. Well, this, I'll show you this one. Um, this Easter was no different. I took, um, I took sunflower starts and uh, one of our nieces brought strawberry plants that actually had strawberries on them that was really sweet. And another one brought us these precious little, look at these little impatients and these beautiful little bowls. Well, guess what? It can't live in here. There's no drainage holes, y'all. So this is a perfect little table accessory, but this will get planted into one of my containers. Drainage is key, y'all. Totally so important. Um, great soil, that's part of making great soil is that water can run through it. And then when you add that compost or manure, that helps it to become a sponge um, and, and save on the water. So I have some questions here and then I'll look back and see what y'all have written on there. So we have some non-container questions, which is fine because I don't have very many questions this week. Becca over on Instagram asked, should she pinch her zinnias before or after planting them? So the answer in a nutshell is you can do either. Here's the key. If you pinch them before you plant them out in the garden, you need to pinch them and let them recover and start to get little shoots from where you pinched before you transplant them. That's too much at one time. Or don't pinch them in the tray, plant them, let them get established, then pinch them. So you're not pinching them when they're stressed. So you can do either way. Um, so Brenda asks, is there a different potting soil for containers? So I'm, th I'm thinking she's asking because I know she's a soil blocker, I think. Um, the problem with using soil blocking mix in containers is it's made, soil blocking mix is made to be compact and we want container mix to be open and airy, right? So air, water can run through freely and roots can get through freely. Um, so if you add to your um, blocking mix, if you're making blocking mix by the recipe, you need to add vermiculite or perlite to help loosen it up a little bit. And so Mary Lynn asked, how does one start a sweet potato vine? And I'll be honest, I don't know. I've never started one. Sweet potato vine, the ornamental one, that beautiful, which was actually in that um, big pot we just saw last year that's in the picture. Um, they come from a tuber, but it's a specific tuber. So I don't know how you would get that tuber without buying a plant. So, um, you know, again, y'all, for me as a farmer or a busy person, forget me being a farmer. I'm a busy working person. I want my containers to be beautiful instantly, and I want them to be fun to take care of and easy to take care of. And in my opinion, the large container, great soil by big plants, so you have instant beauty, which makes you want to take care of them more. All works together. So, Mary Lynn, buy a sweet potato vine. It's um, called Marguerite, I think. That's my mom's name. So, Lindsay asks a seed starting question. Do you just use cool white lights when growing your seeds? I've heard people say you need warm and cool to get the right balance of light. Well, we do in fact mix them, but I will tell you for years I didn't. There is some truth to that. However, our plants are under lights for such a short period of time with soil blocking and the way that I start seeds and move them out so quickly that it doesn't really make such a big difference. But if you're growing something long-term under lights, it makes a big difference. And if you're trying to get something to bloom under lights, like an African violet or something, it makes a huge difference. So Lindsay, it just really depends on what you're doing. So Sarah asks, have you ever used burlap to line a container like the one pictured? No, because, so I'm just trying to think, I can't, I bought a roll of this fiber um, that lines these hay rack pots that I have and you can buy preformed if you can find the exact shape of your form. It does a lot for the container. Not only does it hold the potting mix in there, it helps to retain moisture, it's tough, it, it, it's thick enough that it insulates a little bit from the wind. So no, I have never used burlap, but plastic inside of that 
lining is what changed my life, y'all. I mean, when I read that in Jessica's book, I just was like, what a dummy I've been. Why did I not think of that, you know, right? That was such a great tip. So Maggie asks, what and how do you feed? So that's a great um, tip. So first off, a container is a freestanding, it has no access to the earth. So the only thing it gets to eat or drink is what you give it, right? So you have to feed. So I said in the beginning of this, if you're just joining us, go back. Um, Shauna, you're such a mess. Um, that's my friend Shauna. Y'all should check her out. She, um, she's uh, quite a person. She has great books, Healthy Living and Wellness. Um, so containers only get what you give them. So I suggest you mix the dry organic fertilizer when you're mixing your potting mix in the wheelbarrow when you're revitalizing last year's potting mix to make this year's potting mix. And then every week in my watering can, um, and it's a pain in the neck because I use a hose to water my pots with. And you um, should water once a week using liquid fertilizer. I use organic liquid seaweed and fish, Neptune's Harvest. It's on our website. Um, so I use a big watering can. I measure it out. It's like three gallons, I think, enough for three gallons. I water my pots first. Then I hit them with that double dipping image of the second dip that I'm pouring in is fertilizer. And I will tell you, they bloom longer. They grow faster. The more you feed, um, and I want to share that. I'm so glad I just thought of this. I wanted to share this super secret tip that I learned. I have a friend that is a landscaper and he did one of those pop-up landscape shops in somebody's like in a supermarket um, parking lot like you see a lot of them do now. And anyway, I went there to buy a basket for a gift for somebody. And so I'm standing there, he wasn't there, and his girl was checking me out, and it was hot as blazes, and it was out in full sun. So she said, oh, step in. It was like a little um, 10 by 10 shed building is what they worked out of. So I stepped into that building, and while she's figuring out how to charge me, I turn around, and I'm, start, I'm reading the walls because there's notes all over it. And I said, what in the world does that mean? She said, oh, that's how we mix, fer that's the ratio of fertilizer we mix when we water the plants every time. That's how nurseries keep those plants beautiful and blooming all the time, y'all, is they put a low dose of your fertilizer in every watering. Um, so that is, so you buy a beautiful plant, you bring it home, and you're watering it, you think you're taking care of it, but lo and behold, about two or three weeks out, it's like, man, it just doesn't look the same, right? Well, it's the food, y'all. It's just like I tell people about why you have to have flowers in your vegetable garden, um, is that if you invite me to your home for a week and you only feed me dinner on Monday and then there's no more food for the rest of the week, I'm bolting, y'all. I am not staying at your house, right? That's why flowers are so important in your garden. Well, if you're not feeding these plants like they've been used to getting, then they're just gonna like give up the goat, even though you're giving them water. You might offer me water for the week, but that still is not enough. I am not happy with you. <laughs> so do you get the picture? Our containers are a result of how we treat them and what we do. And if you wanna make it easy, get a big container, largest container you can afford or find, buy big plants, put great soil, make it easy to water them. Um, and the other thing is, where are you gonna put them? Some of these containers are not exactly where I'd like for them to be, but it is the, it's where I can reach them with the hose, right? That's the reality of um, what makes them work. And I just wanted to show Jessica's book one more time, um, Container Gardening Complete. I really feel like that is just such a great container garden, um, and it show, has so much great go-to information. Okay, I'm just swiping back through here to see if there's any questions. Um, hey, everybody. Hey, Wanda. Wanda's probably gone back. She was on her lunch break. She's up in Alaska. She's a flower farmer in Alaska. So much good info on your Facebook Live broadcast, and they qualify for my Master Gardening Continuing Education. Really? Because you're a well-known speaker. What a deal. Oh, that's nice to know, Jan. I did not know that. 
Um, so let's see. Oh, thank you, Beverly, for sharing. So yes, please, the main thing you can do to help me is to like and share this. Because this is not a great time of day, we don't with us as we normally do. So liking and sharing this, and I think a container class will be very, very helpful to many people. And sharing it on closed groups that I don't have access to really, really helps me. So Beverly, I really appreciate you doing that. So I have lots of highs. Mimi, love caladiums with tall angel wing begonias too. So do you take out the perennial fern? Shake, oh, good question, Mimi. So she's talking about when I'm revitalizing my pots and getting ready to plant them, do I unplant that perennial fern that's in it and shake the dirt off and repot it? I do not do that. I actually kind of remove all the soil except where that fern is because part of the benefit of having a perennial in addition to not having to buy another fern is that um, you get the benefit of it being well established. So I take all the dirt except for right, what's right up against the fern and then put back um, that in there. So Paul, I think somebody answered, he, Mimi answered his question. Um, so Lisa, what is the best commercial product for compost? Don't have any here right now, black cow. So you can buy, you know, compost is readily available. Compost or composted manure, both of them are great products. And there's a lot of different brand names. Black Cow is definitely a great one. I'm trying to think, we've been buying bags for our sunflower mix. Um, we've been buying bags of mushroom compost. That's just what's available. Go to your box store, or I mean, I first say go to your local nursery or your local um, independent garden center and see what they tell them you want, organic compost or composted manure. You do not want any of the sewer sludge products, y'all. It's sold under a lot of different names and they call it organic, which I can't believe that's not what you want. It's stinky and anyway, that's a whole other conversation. You're looking for bagged compost, um, but Black Cow is one of the, the best, um, one of the well-known suppliers. I'm a first time soul blocker. I planted my first day two days ago, my first blocks, and I saw sprouts this morning. Ah, that is wonderful. Who am I talking to? Joy, good for you. Also, my light came today. I'm so excited. Oh, you're welcome for all the help. Um, and so I don't have any other questions here. I'm just trying to think of something else I thought I thought of just a minute ago for your containers. Oh, Mimi, I can't leave my caladiums they don't survive winter here. So they may, I know Mimi asked, do I leave the caladiums and the perennial ferns in the pot over winter and then dig around them? But the caladium bulbs, I'm sad to say, I am not, um, I'm just too overwhelmed with tasks to dig those caladium bulbs and save them. That can be done, but I just buy new plants um, every year. And it's just one of those, this is like a treat for me. Um, and this is, I can't tell you how much we enjoy this garden behind me. And when it's full of these shade garden containers going, it's really, really wonderful. So I want to just say again, I just really appreciate everybody joining me. And if you like on Molly, tips on growing lavender from a seed, yes, buy a plant, Molly. I hate to say that. Lavender is tough to start from seed and the seed is not viable for very long. So if you bought seed last year, there's a good chance it's dead. Um, my niece just went through this and if she watches this, she is gonna laugh so hard because she sent me that very same text and I told her buy a plant. Um, the lavenders are very regionally focused. There's certain lavenders that grow well in certain areas. I think Grosso is the one that grows well here for us and many of them do not start from seed at all. Um, and you have to do cuttings. And so I would investigate the best way to propagate lavender and then maybe go buy one or two plants and do root cuttings if that's what it says. But no tips, I'm sorry to say, for lavender because I've never attempted it because I just know it is a really, really tough one. Um, thanks for all you do, Lisa. What type of fertilizer do you use in containers and in the field? I use Neptune's Harvest. We sell it on our website. You can see it. Neptune Harvest um, 
fish and seaweed is what we actually, the liquid that we use. The dry fertilizer is very regionally based. There's different brands and different regions because most, many of them are made from chicken litter. We only use organic and chicken litter fertilizer products typically are made like in the mid-Atlantic, it is, um, the product used to be called Micro 360. You won't find that anywhere. It's not around anymore, but it's Purdue which has tons of chicken houses in the mid-Atlantic, that's what they, how they recycle. And so, but that stuff is so heavy, they don't ship it all over the country. So you need to look for a um, lick, an organic dry fertilizer that's based on a sustainable product, like chicken litter, not bat guano. Seaweed is another great one. That's a sustainable product. Um, so that's what we do here and um, I see that y'all are visiting people within North Carolina. Hey, y'all, I just did a podcast today. It won't come out until May 4th. He's in South Carolina. It's um, Farmer's Market Podcast. Stefan is his name. And um, so check that out. We talked just about farming and um, gardening. And anyway, it was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed talking to him. And um, so please visit thegardenersworkshop.com, sign up for our newsletter, or if you wanna sign up for my newsletter, you just simply, I'm looking for the information, text to 66866, that's the number, 66866. For people like me that didn't understand how this works, that's the number you're dialing, that's the number you put in, and then in the, in the um, text, in the subject line, you just put flower. And that's my key word. And when you do that, it'll automatically reply and say, okay, put your email right here, and then that will sign you up for my farm news. So that's a really cool thing to do. So, oh, wait a minute, let's see. Mimi, Lisa, I was actually asking if black cow can be used in the soul blocking mix. Yes. You couldn't see my edit. Yes. So any finished compost or manure compost can be used either in container mixing or in the soil blocking recipe proportion to the recipe. Yes, you can, we use that for sure. Um, so you guys, I'm signing off. Um, I have a bunch of my grandma's garden project, you know, the big vegetable garden. We just planted our tomatoes today, about half of them. We planted about a hundred, I think. A bunch of the volunteers, which are, um, friends and family that are a part of it and a niece are a part of this project and they're heading over here and um, I got to get ready. And then I'm heading out at 5 a.m. in the morning to Asheville, flying to Asheville, North Carolina for Mother Earth News and which is why I'm doing this off the normal time Facebook. Um, so hopefully, maybe, who knows, maybe I'll do something from there, but I'll be pretty busy. Um, so as always, I love spending time with you guys and watching Lisa Lives. All of them are always posted on our blog about a week later, but the best thing you can do is to help me is to like and share this broadcast with your friends. And um, I'll be looking at it later. So if you have more questions, pop them on here. Um, thank you, Mimi. And things are really, I'm just not looking forward to the pollen in Asheville. I am suffering and they're like two weeks behind us. So I may have no voice once I get down there. So anyway, till we meet again, folks. Ciao.